Hello everyone and welcome to a very special episode of Retro Horror Games Quest. Today, in the sixth episode, we are going to take a look at the game that spawned the whole idea for this series in my head. It's a game that I've been wanting to play for a very, very long time and for which I have a little bit of high expectations. It is the game that preceded Resident Evil. Yes, I am talking about Sweet Home for the NES. Uh, as if you didn't read that on the title. If you're unaware of the whole connection between Resident Evil and Sweet Home, uh, stick around until the end of the video, I'll go through it a little bit. Oh, and this game is actually a movie adaptation. Again. But in this case, the production of the film and the production of the game were actually intertwined in very interesting ways. So I will do a quick review of the movie as well towards the end of this video if you're interested in hearing that. I'm very excited about this one, but will my expectations be met? It's honestly a little hard to imagine a horror RPG for the NES, but I am all for the weird stuff. I live for this. So without further ado, I would like to invite you into the sweet home of the Mamiya family. Enter. If you dare... Sweet Home was released in 1989 for the NES and was developed by Capcom. The game opens up with a team of five documentary filmmakers approaching a huge mansion. This is Mamiya's mansion. The story goes that, 30 years prior, famous artist Ichiro Mamiya, who lived in this mansion with his family, hid several of his precious original frescoes inside the mansion before disappearing. Since then, many people tried to enter the structure to find the frescoes, but always ended up disappearing or running away with horrible tales of the Mamiya curse. Upon entering the mansion, our team of filmmakers find themselves trapped inside by the ghost of a mysterious woman, who is our main antagonist. Your task? Try to find the frescoes, but most importantly, leave. This is when you first take control. You start by taking control of one of the five filmmakers. You can move around the map in a grid-based movement system, similar to most RPGs of that time. Pressing the A button shows you your active menu where you can find all interactions, functions and informations that you will need. The first option, Party, allows you to change which character you control. Yes, in this game you will have to control and manage all five of the characters, unless one of them meets their fate early on. Yep, this game also has a permadeath system, that's right. You might be thinking right now that managing five characters at once sounds annoying as all hell. And you would be correct, but fortunately, this game does the whole party system the right way. If we jump down a few options on the active menu, we can find an option called Team. If you use this menu when facing another character, you will team up with them, and they will follow you until you choose the team option again to part ways. You can have a total of three people in each team, which means you really only have to manage two teams at once. The leader of each group depends on which character you pick in the party option. Overall, I think this is a great way to handle multiple characters without having them all party up and controlling just one of them. Plus, having to separate from time to time really, really adds to the horror atmosphere. Going back to the active menu, you also have an item option, which will, well, display your items. Each character can hold two items, one weapon and their tool. You know what that means? Inventory management! Mmm, tastes like survival horror. What accent was that? The tools are unique to each character and cannot be swapped. But worry not, you can find items on the map that substitute these unique tools. So if a character dies and you need theirs, you can find a substitute if you look around. Let me run you through the tools now and, while doing so, introduce you to the characters on a more personal level. First, we have Kazuo. His unique tool is a lighter, which can be used to burn ropes which might be blocking away and to light candles. Then, we have Akiko. Her unique tool is a medical kit, which, although it does not heal, is very useful to cure poison and other status effects you may be subjected to during battle. Here we have Taro. His unique item is a camera, which you can use to photograph and preserve the frescoes. Next, we have Asuka. Her unique tool is a vacuum cleaner. Uh. Yeah, I, I also didn't understand why anyone would bring a vacuum cleaner on a filmmaking, fresco-preserving adventure until I learned that it's this weird machine that is legitimately used to clear dust and other debris to preserve works of art. And yeah, like the description I just stated, it is used mainly to remove dust from the frescoes in the game. And finally, we have Emmy. Her unique tool is another super important one, a key. 
But not just any key, it opens a lot of doors inside the mansion. I was wondering how she got her hands on such a key, but the movie does go a little bit more into that. So I'll go more in depth on that when we discuss the film later on. I actually don't know what happens if she dies, because I have not seen another skeleton key, let's say, scattered around the map. But maybe it spawns if she dies, I don't know. So, with the character introductions out of the way, let's move back to the active menu. Here we have some more interactive functionality like talk and look, which are used to talk to other characters and observe stuff in the mansion. And finally you can save and quit the game. Choosing quit will also let you reload your last save if you so desire. So you start exploring the mansion and finally find your first fresco. By using Taro to take a picture of it, letters appear. There are many frescoes scattered around the mansion, and taking pictures of them will either expand on the story or reveal hints to help you on your next objective. So it's a good idea to find and preserve as many as you can. Sometimes it's not as easy as just taking a picture though. The fresco might be covered with dust, and thus you will need to use Asuka's vacuum cleaner to clean it up before taking a photo. And because of that, I'd advise teaming up both Taro and Asuka in one of the groups so that you don't have to do too much back and forward to preserve a fresco. Exploring the mansion is fun. The atmosphere is pretty spot on and the mansion feels creepy and oppressive, which is pretty impressive on an NES. Much like survival horror games that came after, you use keys, yes there are other keys apart from Emmys, to unlock doors, find notes which expand on the story of the mansion, collect resources and puzzle items, and manage the f out of your inventory. But it's not all fun in games while exploring the mansion. There's always danger lurking around. Before tackling the obvious danger of the creatures roaming the halls of the mansion, I'd like to touch on the traps. Yeah, this game has a trap system. Well, maybe trap is the wrong word for it, but basically while walking around, depending on where you step or walk near, an item might be thrown at you or fall on you. You have a limited amount of time to decide what to do. Should I duck? Dive left? Dive right? Pray? Wait, pray? Uh, okay, y yeah, I'll, I'll handle the whole prey thing later. I'm not sure if there's always a right answer for these events. I've seen some people suggesting on the internet that I should take notice of the direction the object is coming at me from and dive in the opposite direction, but I feel like this does not work every time. So maybe it's random or percentage based? Either way, the amount of damage done to you if it fails is very minimal, so it's not a big deal. And it's not like these things happen all the time. I think I encountered between 10 and 20 during my 9 hour playthrough. Other dangers outside of battles include these annoying ghosts that will carry whichever character they touch into another room in some other part of the house. It's always the same room, thankfully. And then we have quicksand and good old Indiana Jones approved giant boulders in the mansion, because why not, sure. There are also these holes on which you can use a wood board to travel over and cross the gap. The problem with these is that if you traverse them with a team, it's very likely someone from the team will fall on the hole and discard the wood board. And then you have to use team on the person who is struggling to climb up so that you can help them up. I don't know how limited wood boards are, but I did get stuck once or twice and able to find more and had to reload the game until I figured out that traversing the wood board with just one character would prevent it from falling. Other than wooden boards, the mansion is filled with a lot of weapons and items. I actually finished the game without knowing what some of these items did. Considering the limited inventory space, I would often leave objects on the ground, memorize their position and then come back if I stumbled upon something or some place where I would be able to use it. But for example, there were these peels and wires scattered around everywhere and I never had a use for them, so I have no idea what they do precisely. I'm guessing that the peels are a substitute for Akiko's medical kit in case she dies or if you're too far apart, but that's just a guess. There are other items that can be used inside the mansion though. For example, you can find a rope that allows you to traverse specific significant floor gaps. You can also use the wax candle to illuminate completely dark rooms. And you will eventually find a flashlight that is used to disperse what the game calls shadows, which are these obstacles that do not allow you to continue down a corridor. Alright, and finally on to the turn-based battles. While exploring a mansion, you can encounter enemies in two different ways. Some of the enemies are visible on the screen and can be avoided, while others will appear in the form of random encounters. I don't really understand the distinction made here, since not all enemies represented on a map are special in any way, like these bats, but it's nice to have some of them appear on the map. The random encounter ratio is not too crazy, it was enough so that I would never have to grind for levels. I actually reached the maximum level of 20 with each character an hour or so before finishing the game, so it seems like the whole thing is pretty well balanced. 
Each level, though, is a huge difference. Every time you level up, you can see a considerable amount of improvement when fighting enemies. Which means that if you are underleveled, it might be very easy to get wrecked very quickly. Just avoid running from enemies, I guess. You'll be fine. The battles are represented in the standard turn-based RPG battle system of the time. Your enemy appears in front of you and you can pick your actions using the battles menu system to attack, use a tool or an item, pray, there's that praying thing again, or call someone from another team. That's right, you can call people from other teams during battle. The first time I saw this, I thought it was genius. It complemented the team system so well. Here's how it goes. You choose the call action during battle and you can pick a character to call over to the current fight. After this, you are booted off the battle and put in control of the character you called over. And now you have limited time to reach the character that is currently in combat. Touching the character in battle will introduce the called character including everyone who is on their team into the same battle. It's really, really cool. But fret not, even if you cannot get the called character into the fight in time, you can use the call function again on the next turn. Okay, let's not delay this whole praying thing any longer, shall we? Yeah, at multiple points during the game, not just in battle, you have the option to pray. Praying consumes spray points, and they have many uses, even though most of them are not really clear. In regular battles, praying seems to heighten the attacking power of your characters, and in some boss battles they might affect how the battle proceeds. You can also pray while investigating certain sections of the mansion or solving a puzzle, and that might activate some event. It's kind of a weird, mysterious system, but I actually really liked it and never felt like it was too obscure. During a battle with some enemies, you might also fall victim to certain status effects, including poisoned and frozen. These are not too annoying though, as long as Akiko is still alive, since you can just move her near the afflicted character, if they're not in her team, and use a medical kit. The annoying thing is that some of these status effects seem to remove the character from their team automatically, and that's pretty annoying. This means that you have to move Akiko over, cure the character, and then re-add the character to the team they were on. And if the character was in the middle of the three-person team, it automatically disbands the whole team. So you have to individually team up with every character again. It's annoying, but somewhat understandable, I guess. I mean, if someone is frozen, obviously the rest of the group would move without them. But I feel like they should only abandon their teams if someone from the team decided to move. But that's a minor complaint, so... The enemy variety is pretty good. Some of the enemies are legit gross and disturbing. I think if I played this when I was a kid, I would have been scarred for life. And of course, that is an excellent thing in a horror game. You will fight cursed dolls, skeletons, half-zombies, this vomiting guy, crazy creatures, sentient armors, uh, a mirror, um, wall, uh, man? Men. Uh, yes, man. L let's just leave it at that, okay? L let let's move on, let's move on. And without spoiling anything, the design of the last boss fight of the game is also excellent and disturbing, as it should be. Not to mention that, apart from creatures, there's a lot of other disturbing and gross stuff going on in the game. But I don't want to spoil anything. The story is well made, albeit simple, and feeling what happened in a mansion was very satisfying. The last section of the game is a little bit annoying, but after a bit of strategy adjusting, I managed to breeze through it. And the final boss battle has a very satisfying mix of puzzle elements in it. The sound and music are pretty good. There are some very nice tunes in the game. Some are creepy, and some are adrenaline filled. But not in the happy-go-lucky tones of, for example, the game I reviewed previously, Uninvited. They actually create excellent tension that fits the atmosphere. Two tracks are a bit annoying though. One of them only becomes annoying after you listen to it for a while, while the other makes me want to rip my ears off. Thankfully that one only plays in one section of the game, which is not very long. Alright, so that is it for the game. But, before we jump into the conclusion and the score reveal of this game, I would like to discuss the movie a little bit. So let's go. The movie, of the same name, was released in theaters a few months before the game. Its production did precede that of the game, and its executive producer, Juzo Itami, and its director, Kiyoshi Kurosawa, also served as the game's producer and supervisor respectively. The movie follows a very similar premise. It stars the same main characters as the game, Kazuo, Emi, Akiko, Asuka and 
uh, Taguchi? Wait, why did they rename Taro to Taguchi? Or actually the other way around, since the game started production after the movie. I'm guessing it was due to limited character space for the names. Taguchi was just too long to put in the game, so they shortened it to Taro. At least that's what makes sense to me. Unlike the game, the movie does contain a lot more character development. We learn a lot about the characters we've followed into the mansion during the game. For example, Emi is Kazuo's daughter. I didn't even know Emi was a young girl. Also, Emi seems to be trying to get her widowed father and Akiko together. Taro, or Taguchi, appears to be a creep, and Asuka is a full of herself TV host and art preserver. It's kinda weird to learn more about these characters after the fact. Just like the game, they go into the mansion to find Ichiro's frescoes, and they do get a key from the property owners, which explains Emi's key in the game. The movie opens up with a promotional ad for the game, which contains a theatrical version of one of the game's songs, so I was fully expecting the soundtrack to be like that. Unfortunately, it seems the soundtrack similarities end on that promotional trailer. The story beats are the same overall. I won't go through it now just to avoid game spoilers. Some scenes are incredibly dumb though. For example, there is one scene where a character seems to be affected by some shadows and starts melting. Two characters witness the whole thing until the man completely melts and his brittle bones fall on the floor. This goes on for maybe three or more minutes? I didn't count, but only after the bones hit the floor do the other two characters start screaming and ran away. What the hell? No one reacts like that, come on movie. That is just one example, there are more scenes like this, but I want to keep this short, so I'll go into some positives now. I like the direct connections that the game made to the movie, like the half-zombie, the shadows, the design of the frescoes, and how to preserve them. And the transformation of the last encounter looks exactly the same between versions. And that last encounter is the best scene in the movie. The film does have some really cool practical effects, and that's the main saving grace. The acting is not that good overall, the actions the characters take are often nonsensical, like every horror movie. No, I'm joking, not all movies are like that, but yeah, a lot of the movies around this time were like that. The music, unlike the game, clashes too much with the atmosphere, but it was, overall, a disappointment. I'm really, really glad I played the game first. So that's Sweet Home, both the game and the movie. I know I didn't mention the puzzles that much during the review, but they are there. There's just not a lot to tell about them. You find items, you use the correct items in the correct places to solve the puzzle, stuff happens, and that's it, you move on. They are nothing special, but they're there. They're fun. So, is it a horror game? Heck yeah it is! The subject matter, the setting, and the designs of the mansion and the creatures that inhabited really make sure of it. And it is definitely a survival horror in its pure essence. In the form of an RPG. Because why not? It's really not hard to see how a remake of this game became Resident Evil. Oh yeah, I did say I was going to go through the connection between this and Resident Evil. So what happened was that when the project that we now know as Resident Evil was starting, Shinji Mikami was tasked with remaking Sweet Home. Later on, that project actually turned into something more like an original survival horror game with elements from Sweet Home, and that that ended up becoming the Resident Evil that we know and love. Wow, that was a long one, so let's wrap this up, shall we? I give Sweet Home for the NES four stars out of five, with a survival horror fan required play score of... Yes! Definitely, yes! Finally, we broke the three-star barrier! This game is truly amazing and it really does show a blueprint of what survival horror games became in the future. And that alone makes it very special. It's just a plus that the game itself is excellent. Oh, uh, and the movie? Um, I would give it maybe 1.5 stars out of 5. You can skip it, but if you really love the game, it might be a fun watch. Just don't expect anything that great and you will be entertained at least. Boy, am I glad this didn't disappoint. I was really afraid that the game that sparked the idea for this series would become a letdown. Thankfully, that was not the case. And I will for sure replay this in the future, just like I do all my favorite survival horror games. So next time on Retro Horror Games Quest, we will take a look at another classic that I have actually never played. The original Alone in the Dark. I'm super excited about this one as well, and I cannot wait to dig in. 
If you really enjoyed this video, please remember to click like, subscribe and hit the bell to get notified when the next Retro Horror Games Quest becomes available. It would really help me a lot. And if you want to check more Retro Horror Games Quest episodes, you can do so by going to my channel or clicking the link for the playlist in the description. And a huge, huge thank you to my patrons. You guys are the fuel that moves this machine. I really, really hope that you are enjoying my output. Last thing I want to do is disappoint you guys. So thank you for being scared again with me tonight. And I hope to see you here for the next episode of Retro Horror Games Quest. Good night.